Satan has a lot of pictures. He looks like a happy fellow. I can't really imagine he's that happy, uh, but uh, he looks like it. I'm not so sure about the horns either. Uh, probably, since he can impersonate an angel of light, uh, he has some better, some better appearances, but uh, this is uh, the idea that some people have concerning what Satan looks like. But here's the important thing. Satan does not stand in the truth. That's the job of Christians. And if we fail to stand for the truth, then we have failed, period. It is our work to stand in the truth. Uh, and by the way, we get this from the passage just read for us. He does not stand in the truth. The passage also said there is no truth in him. Therefore, as a Christian, there should be no lies in us. Another point from that passage, when Satan lies, he is using his own resources. He is the origin of untruth. And uh, a fourth point from that text is he is a liar and uh, the father of lies. He's, he's the one who invented lies. So he's quite skilled in what he does. And he is quite handy in manipulating the truth and slanting it to serve himself or just outright contradicting what is the truth, as we'll see in a few moments. Now, you may wonder, what is the value of a lie? I hope nobody came saying, boy, now I can really get some good use out of these things. Uh, that's not quite the way approach we're going to take tonight. Uh, but we're going to see how lies have served people who use them. So we want to look at eight lies this evening and see what was accomplished as a result of those things. Let's begin with the very first lie spoken by the serpent. God had said concerning the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 3. Uh, Eve repeated that when Satan asked her about it. The devil, through the serpent, promised, you will not surely die. So we want to notice that contrast. Uh, Eve stated it just a little bit differently. Let's go to Genesis 2.18 for how it was said to Adam. You shall surely die. Satan, you shall not surely die. The word not causes the meaning to be reversed. It's a negation of the preceding uh, statement, a direct contradiction, a denial, a lie. Well, what was the result of this lie? Sin entered the world, which changed it from the very good place of beauty and harmony that God had designed and created to a place of sorrow, pain, toil, and death, plus spiritual death, which is separation from God, physical death being the separation of the body from the spirit, spiritual death being the separation of the spirit from God. So these are the results of the very first lie. And uh, we must do something about that, or we will remain separated from God. If we do not let, in other words, Jesus' blood cleanse us from our sins, then that separation that sin brings between us and God will be permanent. It will be eternal. So God has given us an opportunity to do something about it, and we really need to take advantage of that opportunity. 
Now, this is one that most everybody is familiar with. We've looked at this uh, a number of times. The second lie comes from, that we're going to look at in the Old Testament, uh, comes from a source that we would not expect, and that is from the faithful Abraham. He told this lie on two separate occasions, and later his son Isaac told the same lie. Now, by looking at this, we are simply looking at what the Bible records. We're not trying to denigrate Abraham despite uh, making mistakes. Uh, faithful people in the Bible are saved. Uh, God forgives them these sins. Uh, but we do recognize that such men as even the great Abraham were not necessarily perfect. And uh, just like we're not necessarily perfect as we know all too well. Abraham told the Egyptians in Genesis 12 and the king of Gerar in Genesis 20 that Sarah was his sister. Now, some have argued that since she was actually a half-sister, it was not actually a lie. But the purpose of giving out this information was what? To deceive. So it is a lie. It misrepresents their relationship, and that was the purpose of telling it. Well, anyway, later on, when Isaac, uh, when Isaac said it, it was clearly a lie since Rebekah was not his sister. What was the result of the first time Abraham said this? Well, Sarah was taken into the house of Pharaoh. And God smote the Egyptians with plagues. Hmm, a foreshadowing of something to come, perhaps? Anyway, that was because he had taken another man's wife. And so Pharaoh became angry with Abraham for what might have happened because of the lie that he had told. Let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 12, beginning with verse 13. Genesis 12, beginning with verse 13. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. Abraham was afraid, since Sarah was uh, a very uh, attractive woman that uh, they might say hey this is this is her uh, husband let's kill him and take her so to avoid that he came up with the idea of saying they were brother and sister where they would treat him well and not kill him uh, so it was when Abram came into Egypt the Egyptians saw the woman that she was very beautiful and the prince, uh, princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Now this is not a good situation any way you look at it. He did treat Abraham well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, uh, male and female servants, uh, female donkeys and camels. And the Lord plagued, or but the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her for my wife. Now therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded the men, his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So this uh, was the result of the lie. Pharaoh became very angry and uh, sent him away. Well, then next we find in Genesis 20... Uh, of a similar situation. Let's go and begin with uh, the very first verse down to verse 9 of Genesis chapter 20. And Abraham journeyed from there to the south 
and dwelt in Kadesh and Shur, and uh, sojourned in Gerar. Now Abraham said of Sarah his wife, she is my sister. Uh, apparently he didn't learn anything from the first time. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, She is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands have I done this. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all of his servants and told all these things in their hearing, and the men were very afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said, What have you done to us? How have I offended you, that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. And uh, then the uh, situation played out from there. But basically the same thing happened on both occasions. It could have been catastrophic except God intervened. Had God not intervened, uh, there could have been adultery committed. Now these lies caused ill feelings that's the value of these lies they caused ill feelings toward their neighbors and could have led to greater sins and the same response is basically the case with Isaac as well now we come to the third lie we want to, uh, to look at and this for this we go to Genesis chapter 27 Genesis chapter 27, verses 18 through 24. This involves stealing the blessing that Isaac was going to give to uh, Esau, but Jacob stole it. We read in Genesis 27, 18, So he went to his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. That is a lie. There's no way that Jacob did not know uh, who he was and who his brother was. He was not having an identity crisis here. Uh, and so he deliberately deceived his father. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God brought it to me. No, that's another lie. His mother brought it to him. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. Isaac didn't believe it. So Jacob went near to Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy, like his brother's Esau hands, so he blessed him. And then he said, Are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. That's a, a sad situation to tell so many lies to his own father. But that is precisely what happened. The result, he uh, got the blessing, but notice verse 41. In verse 41 we read, 
So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing which his father uh, blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Naturally, he did not kindly receive this uh, deceit that had uh, cost him his blessing. And uh, what was the result? Besides his brother hating him, so far as we know, Jacob never again saw his mother. So far as we know, Rebekah never again looked upon her favorite son. So this did cost both of them. He got what he wanted, but he also lost something very important. Well, let's go on to the fifth lie, or the fourth lie, and that is in Genesis chapter 31. I know it seems like we're not ever going to get out of Genesis, but, but we actually are. Uh, it's just that we find these, uh, and they're just hard to ignore. Uh, Genesis chapter 31, beginning with verse 33. Laban went into Jacob's tent, into the Leah's, and into the two maids' tents, but he did not find the household gods that he was looking for. Then he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's. Now Rachel had taken the household idols, uh, put them in the camel's saddle, and she sat on them, and Laban searched all about the tent, but he did not find them. And she said to her father, Let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise before you, for the manner of women is with me. And he searched, but did not find the household idols. So she was successful, or was she? What was the result? Jacob unwittingly pronounced a death sentence upon her. He had said in verse 32, with whomever you find your gods, do not let him live. Well, he didn't find them, but she still died in giving birth to her second and final son, Benjamin, because Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. It's amazing how often lies are used to cover up other sins. She had sinned by stealing now she had to lie to cover up the fact that she had stolen. One sin often leads to another, and uh, in this case it was fatal for her. The fifth lie. Now we're out of the book of Genesis. Uh, we want to look at Saul. He had been given instructions which he had not kept. And uh, for that one, we go to 1 uh, Samuel chapter 15, beginning with verse uh, 13. Then Samuel as went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. True or false? Samuel said, well, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? He had been commanded to destroy them, but he had brought them back. Nevertheless, he said, I have obeyed the commandment of the Lord, and that turned out actually to be a lie. And what was the result of this lie? The result was the loss of his kingship. In verse 26, Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. By the way, there's another example of courage on the part of Samuel. Most prophets would uh, possibly have been reluctant to have addressed a king in that manner. But it was the truth of God that needed to be told and so he informed him. But that was the value of the lie. He lost his kingship. Number six, we go to the man of God in 1 Kings chapter 13 and verse 15. 1 Kings chapter 13, Jeroboam 
has taken over the kingship. He has, uh, he was given the kingship by God, but then he introduced all of the four departures that uh, he invented to keep people from going back to Judah and being reunited with his brethren. So a prophet was sent to rebuke him for what he had done. This man is not named. He is simply called the man of God. Now, the man of God had been charged with uh, not going back the same way he came and not eating or drinking in the city. God had forbidden that. So let's see what happens. First uh, Kings chapter 13 and verse 15. Then this older prophet said, come home and eat bread. And he said, I cannot return with you nor go in with you. Neither can I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. He knew what God had said to him. He was uh, quite familiar with what God had said. For I have been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by going the way you came. And he said to him, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. Now what was the value of that lie? The result, when he departed home, he was killed by a lion. Verses 23 through 24. The lion did not devour him. He sat by him so that all would see that this was of the Lord. So it cost him his life to believe a lie. Number seven. Ahab's false prophets in 1 Kings chapter 22. Let's go over there and look at uh, verse 6. 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse 6. Ahab and Jehoshaphat were together, and they had decided to go up and conquer Ramoth Gilead, which had once belonged to them. And so the king of Israel gathered the prophets together. Now, these, these are not prophets of God. Uh, there were a number of prophets of Baal killed, just a few chapters earlier, some of these may still have been other prophets of Baal or Ashtoreth or who knows. However, they were not true prophets of God. These are false prophets. And so the king of Israel gathered them together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight or shall I restrain? So they said, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. They all agreed that that was the message. In verse 11, Zedekiah, the son of Kenaniah, uh, had made horns of iron for himself, and he said, Thus says the Lord, with these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. Now, Jehoshaphat had the presence of mind, for all the good it did him, to say, is there not a prophet of the Lord? And so there was yet one man, Micaiah, and uh, they consulted him as to what would happen. And he said, do not go, do not go. And then he even explained how that lying spirits had been put in the mouth of his prophets. Notice verse uh, 17. Then he said to me, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep who have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. That indicates the king's death. They have no more leader. They have no more shepherd. Verse 37. So the king died and was brought to Samaria and buried with the kings in Samaria. So we have tragedy. Uh, I don't know that it was bad for Israel. It was certainly bad for Ahab. 
because he would not listen. He chose the lies of 400 false prophets over the truth of one prophet of God. And he paid the price. Just as predicted, he was killed. That was the value of the lies the false prophets told. Then number eight. Naaman the Syrian had been cleansed of his leprosy. And uh, in the Second Kings 5, 21 through 27, the king, or Naaman rather, had asked Elisha if he could leave him some uh, goods, some belongings, some wealth of some kind, and Elisha said no. Well, Gehazi thought that was too good of a deal to pass up. So after uh, he had departed, Naaman had departed, Gehazi went out after him and said, Oh, uh, we just now have somebody who could use uh, some of that wealth you offered. Let's look at uh, 2 Kings 5 and uh, verse 21. Uh, he ran and caught up with them and he said, Is all well? And he says, All is well. My master has sent me saying, Indeed, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. Okay, what was that? Number one, lie number one, my master sent me. No, he didn't. That was a lie. Lie number two, two young men had come. That was a lie also. There hadn't been two young men who had come. This was just made up out of his own mind. So Naaman said, verse 23, please take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents in silver in two bags with changes of garments, handed them to two of his servants, and they uh, carried them on ahead of him. When he came to the citadel, he took them from their hand and stored them away in the in his house, and then he let the men go, and they departed. Now when he went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said to him, Where did you go, Gehazi? He said to him, Your servant did not go anywhere. Lie number three. And then he said to him, Did not my heart go with you when you, uh, the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep, oxen, and male and female servants? What was the value of this lie? Verse 27, Therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence leprous and as white as snow. That was the value. So what is the value of a lie? What are the results that we have seen? Separation from God? with Adam and Eve. They had to hide themselves from his presence, or try to. All manner of evils entering into the world. Near misses with adultery. A separation of a mother and a son. The death of a beloved wife. Loss of one's kingdom. Loss of life. The, men of, uh, the man of God and also Ahab being struck with leprosy. These are the results. These are the values of what they got for telling their lies. We cannot change these lies. They are already recorded. They're a matter of history. They, they can't be changed or altered. They've already happened. But one of the deadliest lies is still being told. And we can do something about that. We can challenge it. This is not the lie. This is the scripture. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now look at that. Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. 
Denominationalism says he who believes and is not baptized shall be saved. That ne not negates Mark 16, 16, just like the not uh, negated what God said in the Garden of Eden. Look at it again. God told Adam, you shall surely die. Satan, you shall not surely die. Mark 16, 16, who who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Denominationalism, he who believes and is not baptized shall be saved. What's the difference between those two lies? There isn't any. They're exactly the same. The, the, the subject may be different, but the the protocol, the procedure, is exactly the same. You take a statement that God says and you stick a knot in it to make it say the exact opposite of what God said. And it doesn't matter whether Satan did that in the Garden of Eden or denominationalists are doing that to Mark 16, 16. It's still the same thing, adding a knot and negating what God has said. People have lost many things because of lies, but this one causes their souls to be lost. When somebody says, he who believes and is not baptized shall be saved, they are saying, well, all I have to do is believe. That's all I have to do is just believe and I'll be saved. I don't have to be baptized. It's not necessary. And that's what millions of people are being taught today. It is a lie, just like any other lie that Satan has ever told. It negates the truth just as the very first lie ever told negated the truth. And so we might ask this evening, have you been living according to the lie? or according to the truth. Saul of Tarsus was told, and now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Satan says, you don't have to arise. You don't have to wash away your sins. You don't have to be baptized. You'll be saved anyway. It's a lie that will keep people out of heaven. And for that reason, it is extremely serious and must be challenged by the people of God. Have you followed a lie or are you following the truth? Did you obey a lie or did you obey the truth? Only the truth can set you free. A lie leaves you in bondage. This evening the invitation is offered if you have not obeyed the truth, we invite you to do that tonight. It's not enough to believe. You must be baptized if you've repented of your sins. And then the blood of Christ will wash your sins away as you are in the water, and you will arise from that watery grave to walk in newness of life. We invite you to come if you need to, if you've already done that but have not been walking according to the truth, we invite you to repent and get back on the right course. Come if you need to while we stand and while we sing.